I have I'm always happy to be here. It's a little bit sad that this is the last gathering. Not necessarily. <laughs> very good. Very good. I'm not I just wanted to begin by expressing my, my uh, gratitude for having been you know, for the possibility to have been part of this because in the beginning I, I wasn't sure um, what kind of gathering this would be but I think that the format of having a, a group of people whose job it is to attend so to speak and then having uh, guests who appear once or maybe more once is I think very fruitful and, and has provided the possibility for um, interesting and um, interesting discussions that we have learned from. I think. So thanks for this. Um, the text that I have contributed to in beforehand is too long, of course. Um, it's just something that I have realized that it's easier for, for me, and in this case for me and Bart, because Bart and I have co authored this. Our director about the bar, Mukha, to sort of think through things um, in a slightly uh, longer format and then condense them for a presentation and then leave them hanging and maybe change them afterwards. So rather than coming up with a very short thing and then writing a longer text, we prefer to do it the other way around. Um, the term that we are proposing is a term that uh, Mukha, the Museum of Contemporary Art Antwerp, has actually been using for some time without really. Mm, explaining even to ourselves, mm -hmm. and it's the art hypothesis. I have an ongoing discussion with art about this kind of coinage, you know, because I think that it's not enough just to, to invent a new um, combination of words that, that we like and that we feel have some kind of meaning that might be communicated to others but that we should also make sure to, to think it through and explain it and, in a metaphorical sense, sell it to other people, particularly our collaboration partners. So we took this opportunity to revisit the term that we have been using and look at it critically and think what it could actually mean. And the art hypothesis is something that the museum has been writing into its policy plans, the policy plans that we have to feed to the Ministry of Culture of the Flemish government every five or six years. And there are basically three um, reasons for us using this term. The first one is the question, some terms that have been around for a long time, basically since the French Revolution or, or the aftermath of it, the um, terms such as um, artist, creator, curator, mediator, exhibition, viewer, visitor, public and audience. And they haven't lost their usefulness, but I think they are more useful if we constantly question them and remember that they are actually referring back to uh, a 19th century reality, a bourgeois, uh, system um, and we should not necessarily um, assume that they are progressive terms today. And so it's good to come up with alternatives to these terms that otherwise become um, a sort of default for any cultural policy and perhaps uh, risk um, keeping us stagnant. It's also something, I mean, I bring this cultural policy discussion with me from my native Sweden, where it has been dominated since the 70s by um, the programs of the Social Democratic Party. And the programs that were once productive, once progressive, but have, um, as the decades have passed, of course also stagnated, and they also need questioning. The second reason for using the term the art hypothesis when talking to our politicians is uh, that we want to prevent art from becoming part of the leisure economy, uh, also in an unthinking way. We want to introduce a sort of surprise moment, uh, a rhetoric that comes from somewhere else, in this case from, from um, the field of knowledge production, perhaps academia, mm. in order to um, 
situate ourselves as a different kind of museum, not a historical museum, but also not a trans-historical museum, not, not a museum that, that really becomes part of the leisure economy by mixing different periods and, and presenting them as a sort of enhanced alternative to the historical museum. And one example of this latter category of museum could, for instance, be uh, the new Met you know, and the Brower building in New York, if you look critically at what they're actually doing. And particularly the exhibition Unfinished, with which they started their new program, I think was problematic in this respect. That's very subjective, and that's in fact the third reason for us using this term, that we want to insist on the subjectivity of the institution to coin its own terms, provided of course that it can defend them in a discussion with others. Uh, in fact, we see um, each institution as an, like an autopoetic uh, entity, an entity that continuously creates and recreates itself, its language and its values. And this is our modest contribution to that process, to talk about the art hypothesis. And I'm going to read a little bit from the text, but not all. Mm. We combine the words art and hypothesis into a term because we prefer not to pretend to know what art is. We do it also because we wish to avoid defining the meaning of art by default as a mere function of the context we work in. Put simply, we want to strengthen the community we are part of by not accepting its consensual definitions of what we do and should do as a contemporary art museum before we have tested them to see how meaningful they are to us. In this sense, as I just said, we insist on the subjectivity of the institution, on its agency as a societal subject, and on its capacity, indeed, its obligation to create, disseminate, and defend its own concepts and operations. So, what does hypothesis mean to us and in general? If we look at the Wikipedia entries in various languages, and that is usually a good place to start these days, they remind us that the Greek hypothesis once literally meant to put under, to set before, in other words, to suppose, which is the Latin version of to put under, and to suggest, and that it originally referred to a summary of the plot of a classic drama, a kind of spoiler alert thing in the antique world. So here, it's interesting because here we already have the provisional idea whose merit requires evaluation, which is one of the definitions of a hypothesis. The provisional idea whose merit requires evaluation and which will enable predictions by reasoning. That's another definition. So not just an application of the rules of logic, but also the aesthetic treatment that the unknown may also undergo and indeed merit. And this comes to the unknown, while it may sound a little bit loose and even occult, is actually central and crucial to the understanding of what a hypothesis is and to how the word can be used. Because in science, it is not considered ethical or good behavior, good manners, to formulate a hypothesis about something when you already know too much about it. Because what you know already is supposed to be worked into a hypothesis um, as, a, um, um, as a condition. So, um, I'll continue. It's the realization that our knowledge is insufficient now, no matter how diligently we have gathered it, that should prompt us to use hypotheses as tools to at least prove ourselves wrong. To be of scientific value, hypotheses <coughs> must be falsifiable, preferably through experimentation. If the researcher already knows the outcome, it counts as a consequence, and the researcher should have already considered this while formulating the hypothesis. It's another quote from Wikipedia. So, the framing and interpretation of concepts and theories are rarely clearly separated operations in science and elsewhere. 
Their interpretability is part of what makes hypotheses vibrate from their own putting into question. And this is a quote from Ernst Bloch, über Fiktion und Hypothesen. Yet, for scientific researchers, it is advisable to construct hypotheses in ways that ensure five criteria, that five criteria are met. Testability, or at least falsifiability, parsimony, uh, the economy of rhetorical means, scope, applicability to multiple cases, fruitfulness, prospects for future explications, and perhaps somewhat counterintuitively, the fifth one, conservatism, which means that a new hypothesis should fit with existing recognized systems of knowledge in order to be good. So let's take a closer look at the term that we are pro proposing, the art hypothesis, with all this in mind. For our, purposes, for our purposes as a contemporary art museum, and to help create other institutionality, the concept must be as open-ended as possible, so that it clears our mind for new perspectives and prevents us from falling back onto established dichotomies such as art and society or foreign content. The concept also needs to be as general as possible, so that it avoids excluding not yet known ways of making and understanding art from today's discussions. The concept should be well grounded in our intuition of what we do as a museum and what we should do as a museum, and also well grounded in the facts that our operations and activities help create. Because we are not just an investigator, we are also a creator of facts on the ground as an institution. The concept should furthermore take into account the progress we make with our concrete collaborations with concrete people. At the same time, it should not limit itself to the institution and its own self-understanding, which has sometimes been an unwanted consequence of institutional critique. <coughs> an art hypothesis that fails to develop with the dynamic, dynamic interaction the institution maintains with society, where artists and audiences are just two of many constituencies, also fails to be useful. It is therefore important that the concept be open to amendment, since the practice of hypothesizing always implies risk. So to us, these general requirements for the art hypothesis add up to a raison d'etre for the term, but also for us as an institution, as a museum. And they, if you look at them, they seem to take care of the three first criteria, scope, fruitfulness, and parsimony. Perhaps. Parsimony is a bit fluid. I mean, it may be, maybe you can say that the art hypothesis, by being so um, impenetrable you know, and poetic, it also um, takes care of, 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 of this requirement for good use of rhetorical means, perhaps, if you want. But what about the more challenging criteria, and this is where it becomes interesting, I think, uh, of testability and conservatism. It's, it's, it's notoriously difficult to apply this idea of testability to, to, um, to culture and to art uh, and, and to anything outside of the so-called hard sciences, in fact. Uh, it may not be possible to convince skeptics of the usefulness of a new term without offering more specifics on what its art component should and should not do. What is the art component of the art hypothesis? Mm. One of our purposes is to work out the concept that helps us as a museum be horizontal in our work, not flat, not afraid to raise our heads, but combining the democratic virtues of horizontality in organization and collaboration, with a capacity for verticality in the meetings between both peoples and ideas that our activities orchestrate. We shouldn't be overly optimistic that we can successfully transplant the criterion of testability from science into art, as I just said, but it's also healthy to remind ourselves that we should never start believing our own propaganda. We must always carefully monitor what actually happens before and during and after the meetings that we orchestrate. So in a certain sense, testability could also be uh, a memory, sort of note to self that we should always monitor very closely what we're doing. 
And now, a few words about conservatism. Another purpose for the term is to make sure that the art hypothesis remains ever developing by being informed as much as possible by all the specific engagements and insights and missed opportunities from our past, the already existing images and objects that we have in our collections and in our exhibitions, and their various combinations, and their encounters with the urgencies of our present time. Thus, while the art of hypothesizing is in itself futures-oriented, a certain form of conservatism, or at least of continuity, is indispensable if the art hypothesis is to become more than an intuitively pleasing phrase. Our turn has consequences not only for the institution of art, the institution with a capital I, art as an institution, but also for the art institution, which we prefer not to capitalize, because we see it as a support structure. We have a hunch, as Robert Fillou used to say, that it is the art hypothesis in its open-endedness and openness to change that can bring about the constitutive movement allowing us in our institutional work to pass from the institution which is not capitalized to the <coughs> institution with a capital I and back again. The art hypothesis constitutes an art of poiesis of the given institution different in each case, propelling it forward through time and experience and allowing it to reproduce and maintain itself in its given environment. So, basically, what we're trying to do is to create um, a, a new term that allows us to introduce some of the desires um, that exist in science, the desires coagulating around the notion of knowledge, into the practice of being an art museum because this is notoriously difficult it's notoriously difficult to to, to, to talk about what we do in terms of knowledge uh, there's several ways in which a museum can try to do this and, and we have in, at MUCA been talking quite a lot about what makes museum research specific for instance what are the specific operations and goals um, and methodologies that museum research should employ, and why? And what do we want? How do we want to achieve um, the specificity of museum research? And, and how do we go about doing that? That's that's a separate problem that I'm not going to talk about here. Just flagging it. Um, and then also in, in individual projects, we're trying to to employ the idea of of knowledge um, as desire. And a good example of that. In my mind is the project that we're working on now, that's the final project of the Lanta Nacional Mark II that we're finalizing now, the Temporary Futures Institute, which is based on bringing two communities of people together, artists and futurists, professional futures researchers, uh, because the object of both of these groups and their activities is basically the unknown and the unknowable art and the future. Um, okay, thanks for your attention.